I've always wanted to do that. We'll have one of everything. I always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to do that. I just wanted to do that. I always wanted to do that! Next round on me! <laughs> Hey everybody, it is Kat Neville. I am the publisher of Feast Magazine here in St. Louis. And I am so excited to welcome you to the first of our three at-home celebrations. Of course, we are celebrating Mardi Gras this time. And um, if you have been a guest at one of our events previously, um, you know kind of the drill. I'm gonna go through um, some of our sponsor thank yous and then we're gonna dive into the interviews. But this time and the focus of this series is on um, cocktails and cooking demos. So we're going to um, really kind of split this up into three parts where first we're gonna make an amazing cocktail with E.T. from Jack Daniels. Then we're gonna get in the kitchen from uh, with our friends from Kenrick's. There's Steve and Mike. And then I'm actually going to make you my, um, my Tennessee whiskey soaked raisin bread pudding, which is a very sweet way to celebrate Mardi Gras. So I want to thank all of you for joining me. And let me get to our sponsor thank yous because obviously without them and of course with the event, without the event team, none of this happens. So our presenting sponsor is of course Jack Daniels. We want to thank them. Our presenting food sponsor is Kenrick's Market. We also have the beads, which I'm wearing, and these beautiful masks, which you have all been sent, are from uh, Johnny Brock's, of course. And we also have coffee from Old Judge Coffee, because, hello, when you have a good time at Mardi Gras, you need some coffee the next morning to wake you up. Of course you do. And our second liquor sponsor for the evening is Tequila, from uh, from Contigo to Tequila, and I want to go ahead and kick off our party. I'm going to invite all of you to raise a glass with me and say cheers to Mardi Gras. It is a cold, cold night here in St. Louis, and I am excited to kind of warm things up with all of you. So cheers. Let's kick off the fun. Mm, it's delicious. So, speaking of cocktails, I'm going to move my notes out of the way. We're going to chat with E.T. first. And E.T. is uh, based in Los Angeles, but as we chit-chat over the next few minutes, you're going to learn that he actually has some pretty interesting ties to St. Louis. But first, let's make that cocktail so that everybody can kind of join us in the celebration. All right. Hey, thanks for having me on your show. This... Uh... This drink is super fun, super simple, which is a great way to enjoy things, not overcomplicate them. It's a Jack Apple Fizz, and very simple. It's two ounces of Jack Apple. Now, a lot of times when you watch demos on the internet or on stuff like this, it can get really complicated, or you might not have the tools the bartender's using. So this is how we, we measure stuff. However, in your kitchen, I'm sure there's a tablespoon somewhere, and a tablespoon's a half ounce. So if this is two ounces, there's four tablespoons, and you have your jack apple. We're just gonna pour that right over some ice. And now some fresh lemon juice. And obviously the better the ingredients that go into a cocktail, the better the cocktail's gonna take. So we're gonna use fresh lemon juice. Um, half ounce, a third of an ounce, however tart or not tart you want something, pull back or dial it up, whichever's good for you. Then we're just going to top it with some soda water. So whatever brand you love that's bubbly or make it yourself at home. Now, you don't really ever want to shake carbonation or kind of ruin the carbonation, but you might want to stir this a little bit so all the flavors kind of come together. If you don't have a fancy bar spoon, 
Any spoon will work. I have a butter knife. We're just going to put it in the glass. <laughs> get a little spin and make sure all that the bubbles get mixed in with the jack apple and the lemon juice. And then a little half lemon wheel. And there you have the jack apple fizz. This is crazy simple. I mean, it's something that hmm, almost everybody has a lemon hiding out somewhere in their fridge. They have ice, obviously. And, you know, if you just have some sparkling water on hand, I mean, the flavor of the lemon and the flavor of the apple, when, when I read the recipe for, uh, for the cocktail, I was like, okay, this is like really, really simple. Could it really be that tasty? And it really, it's delicious. Well, remember the Jack Apple starts as Jack Daniels. So all the flavors we use at Jack Daniels start with old number seven. Um, and then we, we create this proprietary really liqueur, so an apple liqueur for Jack Apple which has real apple juice, real apples in it. Um, Granny Smith, the predominant one, so you get that crisp green apple flavor. And so it, there are a lot of flavors inherent in Jack. So it's, it's not just one flavor apple. You have the Jack flavors with the apple, with the lemon juice, and then the soda water to kind of tie the whole room together. Awesome. So, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the history of Jack Daniels. And one of the things when we were getting to know each other um, before the event started, I was saying that as part of my bread pudding, you know, I soak these raisins and I was able to use, luckily I had some left. Um, I almost finished this bottle, but I, I saved it and, you know, used it for the, the raisins. But um, it's Tennessee whiskey rather than bourbon. And we were kind of talking about that. So kind of explain the similarities, the difference, what that means. Yeah, so it's a good question because it is confusing. But Tennessee whiskey legally can be called bourbon. Um, it follows all the laws of making bourbon. So if you ever wanted to Google laws of making bourbon, it's the same exact laws for making Tennessee whiskey. The only production difference between Tennessee whiskey and bourbon is a process called charcoal mellowing. And it's rectifying, basically purifying. It's been around for thousands of years. And Jack was taught how to make whiskey uh, from a guy named Nearest Green. And he had gotten the idea for charcoal mellowing, passed down to him generation to generation. And then he taught Jack. And after prohibition, the US government reached out to Jack's nephew who was running the distillery after prohibition. and um, Basically, the U.S. government said you have to call your whiskey bourbon. That's what it is. And Jack's nephew wrote back and said, no, it's Tennessee whiskey. And, forth. and finally, they sent samples of Jack Daniels right off the still, which at that point, if you put it in the barrel, would be bourbon. And then Jack Daniels after it goes through the charcoal. And the government wrote back and said, hey, it's different enough. You can call it Tennessee whiskey. And to really take the confusion out of charcoal milling, think about a water filter. So if you have a Brita filter in your fridge, that's a charcoal filter. So you take tap water, run it through charcoal, and it pulls out impurities. It pulls out some minerals that you don't want in that water. And charcoal kind of does the same thing for whiskey. It pulls out some of the heavy corn because Jack is 80% corn. So some of the oils, some of the fatty acids. And to really, really simplify it, it adds nothing, no color, no flavor. It just pulls out. And what does that mean? How does that help? By toning down some of those corn oils and, and aromas and grainy finish, it allows other flavors to shine, like the vanillas and the caramels and a little banana note you get. Now think about a, a Snickers bar, right? If you take a Snickers bar and all you do is take the peanuts out, you have a Milky Way. It tastes completely different than a Snickers bar, most <laughs> of the same ingredients. So that's kind of like how mellowing pulls some flavors out, lets other flavors shine. Interesting. Um, and so tell us a little bit about the St. Louis connection with Jack Daniels. And we do also have, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, J, uh, ET, but um, all the folks kind of watching at home, there is a chat below. And um, in our other events, we've kind of saved the chat to the end where we could do a live Q and A. And and because we we are kind of like splitting this up into three segments, please feel free to jump in with any questions. We already have one about co of warm cocktails that I'm going to post to ET in just a second. Um, but don't be shy. Toss in any questions that you have for ET, the guys from Kendricks, for me. 
Um, so anyway, just a, a heads up on that. So ET, if you could kind of give us a, a sense of the St. Louis connection to sure. Jack. Yeah, there's there's really two links to to Jack and St. Louis. The first one in, you know, when Jack was alive, he was successful, but it, Jack Daniels is not the Jack Daniels of today back in Jack's day. Um, he sold very locally. It wasn't widely known brand at all. And he, one of his nephews told him about the St. Louis World's Fair and they were having a whiskey contest and they were going to judge whiskeys. And one day Jack just got on his horse and, and said, I'll be back soon. And he went to St. Louis and he entered Jack Daniels into the um, into a World Spirits competition, a World Whiskey competition. And a lot of these brands were much bigger, much more well-known. Some internationally, uh, people came in with scotches and things like that. And Jack was not a tall man. Um, he was five foot two with a size four shoe. So I think a lot of people just didn't know who what to make of Jack in this Tennessee whiskey. And in 1904 at the World's Fair in St. Louis, Jack won a gold medal for World's Best Whiskey. That is a great story. I love that story. I mean, there is so much lore that surrounds the uh, obviously in St. Louis in particular, there's so much lore that surrounds the St. Louis World Fair. And just knowing that, I, I love that story. Yeah, Jack was there. And cool. what's crazy too, so his nephew, um, Jack Daniels, uh, where Jack is made in Tennessee, they went dry before U.S. Prohibition by about 11 years. So at some point when Jack's nephew, who was running the company at this time, realized they weren't going to be able to make whiskey in Tennessee for a while, wasn't going away, and there's a lot of talk of full shutdown, he decided to leave Tennessee and try to reclaim that magic somewhere else. And he picked St. Louis because I think of the... So he, he left with some of the distillery employees to try to, to set up shop. I don't believe Jack Daniels, old number seven, was ever bottled and sold from St. Louis. They did make some stuff. And then, of course, you know, the, the land, the air, everything was different. And a couple of years later, the U.S. went dry. So it, it ended up being a non, you know, it was it's a cool part of our history, but it didn't didn't last long. That is very cool. Um, and I love knowing that he was he was short. I think that there's something really charming about that, which might sound silly, but I think that that's great. You're like, yeah, well, you know, he, he was a unique guy in a billion ways. So he left home around eight years old. He was one of 10 kids and his dad remarried. Then he was one of 13 kids Then his dad passed away and Jack never really got along with his stepmom. So when he was eight, he left and went a few miles down the road, which is crazy talk. Now, if you think about your eight year old and he started working for a guy named Dan call on Dan call and, and Mrs. Call's farm. And he would help out in the general store and he would help out, around the house and the farm. And then he realized Dan Call made whiskey. And that guy Nearest Green um, at the time was an enslaved man. Dan asked Nearest, who he thought was this great distiller, to teach Jack how to make whiskey. And then that started this great friendship between Jack and Nearest. And when when um, emancipation happened and Nearest was a free man and Jack soon after bought the still from Dan, he hired Nearest as his first master distiller. At 13, Jack was 13 when he was running the still for as a business on his own. So, you know, the list goes on. But his look, if you ever see a picture of Jack, that's not how people in distilleries dressed back then. Jack left town, came home in that long coat and his hat and his tie, and no one asked why, and that was his look. Um, he went square bottle instead of round bottle. So kind of everything Jack did was, was a little bit different. It's unique. I love it. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure that we get um, to some of the questions. Um, we have a couple for you. One, and forgive me for leaning forward, I'm looking at my screen. Um, so, as I mentioned, it's essentially zero degrees in St. Louis. You're in Los Angeles, so you're nice and warm. Um, but I'm sure that you have some ideas for ways that we can make some warm cocktails with the Jack Daniels. So, some guidance there? Yeah, for sure. Um, so if we're going to stick to Jack Apple for one second, the, the easy one is hot apple cider. So since we have only a couple minutes, I would say find a great recipe online for apple cider or buy a high quality apple cider, heat it up, throw in some Jack Apple, throw in a cinnamon stick, some nutmeg, whatever makes you happy. Um, and that'll warm you up nice. Another great um, warm cocktail. Uh, it's Valentine's Day this weekend, right? So 
you can steal from my wife and I um, during the holidays. What we do is we make hot chocolate. And again, you can either make it instant or we make uh, homemade. And I add Jack honey, a little bit of uh, Irish whiskey, a little bit of, uh, I mean, Irish cream, a little bit of uh, chocolate coffee liqueurs. Mix that all up, put a little whipped cream on top, and if that's not a Valentine's Day warm me up treat, I don't know what is. Oh my gosh, that sounds good. Speaking of Valentine's Day and also the intersection of Mardi Gras, you got married on the second line at Mardi Gras, and I not think at, have- not at Mardi Gras, but my wife and I um, we have fallen in love with New Orleans. I've been there a billion times, and then when we got married, and I was gone to, or we got, you know, we were dating and we were um, getting engaged. And I had a couple of trips each year to New Orleans. She started saying, well, I want to go to New Orleans. And mm-hmm. then she fell in love with New Orleans. And we're both from the East Coast, living in the West Coast. So we thought it'd be a great place to um, a middle ground for everyone to meet and have a great time. And this picture is us in a second line through the quarter with a awesome. brass band behind us. And so, yeah, we, we love it. And it's, it's a big connection for us. And um, I do see one other question about other pairings for Jack Apple. I would say Jack Apple is really mixable. However, it is Mardi Gras. So uh, when we were speaking before, I said, I wonder if Jack Apple would work in a hurricane, which is a big New Orleans drink. So I tried it and it's fantastic. So the hurricanes you see in New Orleans or during Mardi Gras have evolved into just sugary messes. But the original one was fresh lime juice and passion fruit. So this has um, Jack Apple, an ounce and a half. And then to counter some of the sweet in this cocktail, I took some of our barrel proof whiskey. The one I had was 132.6 proof. So (laughs) mostly mostly Jack Apple with a little bit of the barrel proof, some passion fruit puree, simple syrup, fresh lime juice, and then that splash of pineapple juice shaken. And this is one of the favorite hurricanes I've had. And then instead of a orange and cherry i did a little apple wheel with some or apple fan with some little cherry on top so um et before we let you go because we're gonna have to move on to our jambalaya demo from our friends from kendrick's the recipe that you just mentioned would you be willing to send that our way so we could share yeah i'll i'll put it in the the uh do you want me to put it right in the comment feed um you can do that but even if you want to just you could just send it to me and yeah yeah, uh, for sure sure. we can also uh, put it up on the site as so anybody who heard that is gonna be like wait I'm trying to jot down everything that you just said yeah. so it's, um, it sounds a, it, it's well, a little bit easier on paper than what I just said so um, I'm happy to send that to you that's great ET thank you cheers to you cheers Have to you. Fun. Mm. yum Okay, we're off to an extremely tasty start. And uh, if you know anything about Steve and Mike from Kendrick's, you know that they are all about amazing flavor. So we're gonna get in the kitchen with them for a live demo of their jambalaya, which I've had sitting next to me for about half an hour now. And I have, uh, I think I've actually shown tremendous restraint. I haven't taken a single bite. So I'm waiting until we go through the day. Joe the Butcher here for Kenrick. This Valentine's Day, have a great meal at a great price. Stay home with Kenrick's Sweetheart Steak Dinner for Two with side dishes and dessert. Make dinner, not reservations. Call Kenrick today. Hello, Mike. How are you? And there's Steve. Hi. I'm here. Oh, there we go. Now we have your sound. Perfect. So you're going to show us how to make this classic jambalaya. And obviously it's using your andouille sausage. You guys make all of your sausages fresh in-house. It really is what you pride yourselves on. So I'm excited that we're able to, um, to kind of show everybody how to make this just, I mean, if you look at kind of the, actually what they're going to show you how to make. You have the full recipe in the packet that you received, but I will stop talking. Mike and Steve, take it away. First of all, we'd like to welcome me into my home. I really appreciate you having us on. I'd also like to thank ET for the wonderful idea for the cocktail. I'm also gonna give a shout out for my favorite Jack Daniels drink is a hot toddy with a single barrel Jack, a little hot water and honey. So kudos to ET for throwing that in. 
I'd also like to just start out with what Mike's already doing is Mike's preparing and sauteing the onions. He's the, he has the green pepper, celery, he's got the garlic. He added that with a little vegetable oil. All Mike's doing really is sauteing a little bit. Since you're at this angle, I'm gonna give you a little bit better, better of an angle here. Can you guys that's perfect. Yeah, actually, if you could move it, there we go. Now we can see the plot. That's awesome. Now you're seeing a little more. Yeah. So Mike just went to the second step, and, and all Mike did was add the parsley. He's going to dice up those hand cubes in about three inch cuts. We're going to crumble that bay leaf. We're actually going to leave our bay leaf whole. Uh, we actually leave it whole so you can pull it out at the end. I think it gives a little bit of flavor to it, and uh, it, it helps when you pull it out. And it's not that crispy of a, a piece of, of vegetable. Perfect. So I have a question. So obviously Andouille is kind of the star of the show here. What are the spices? If it's a secret recipe, don't tell me. But, you know, generally, what are the spices that you incorporate? I mean, I cook a lot with sausage because it is so intensely flavorful. And Andouille in particular has just an immense amount of savory flavor. So what is it that it's adding to the jambalaya? Sausage. Oh, so we use a blend. Actually, we have a company that kind of blends all of our seasonings for us after we put them together. And then they come in that way. Each batch of sausage is exactly the same. But um, it's more of a spicy, you know, style of sausage. And then, you know, we do actually the Mardi Gras. We do a bratwurst that we use the same seasonings in the andouille, except it's a fresh one. So we add cure to this and smoke it. It's more, you know, just a, like of a sausage seasoning with the uh, spices in it. It's not too heat, not too hot either. It's a mild hot. Awesome. No, I I just snuck a bite, and um, Bob Rose, who is the genius behind making sure that all of this comes together, he just showed me at the very end. I'm sure he was like, "Oh, I'm going to catch a cat while she's eating," but it is. It's like this really kind of a mild heat. Like you, you definitely know that you have you know, pepper happening, but it's not overwhelming. And I'm, I'm a fan of spice. I can take spice, but, um, you know, this is, it's just kind of like warms you from the inside out. It's lovely. It's absolutely one of the key ingredients to our jambalaya. And when you cook it down, it gives you a little bit more flavor. And also the Mardi Gras brats, the VIP got, that's the brat Mike was referring to. So those are really good on the grill or you can smoke them either way. And again, it, it just gives that tremendous flavor with just a little bit of heat. Like you said, Kat, I don't, I'm not overly heated, but I do like that that flavor and that intensity when it comes along with it. And well, what, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. You no, know, I was going to say, so the um, everybody at home has, um, hopefully they have their jambalaya brats because, uh, you know, that was part of, of the package. And so what's it, like, how do you distill the flavor of this incredibly complex jambalaya into a brat? So that that's pretty funny. And you know what's crazy is, we uh we like to do just crazy stuff and one you know the butcher came up with this and he goes you know what we're gonna make this jambalaya brat and i go that doesn't really sound too good but we 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 took the peppers and the onions and we mix that into the meat and we use our andouille sausage seasoning we chop up um small cubes of ham and uh shrimp and tomato in there and we just kind of put it all together and the first time we tried it it was like, wow, this really is good. We laughed at each other, Kat, because we put shrimp into a bratwurst. Yeah. We actually put shrimp into a bratwurst. And like, this was the most absurd thing. But making Joe the Butcher happy is probably a top priority for Kendrick. So when he said to try it, and like Mike said, <laughs> once we tried it, we were all like, you know what this tastes like? Jambalaya. I mean, how can you go wrong with a bratwurst that tastes like a jambalaya? So Awesome. It's pretty good. So I know we've been chit chatting. Where are you in um, in your in your cooking process? I think we're down to step four, if I'm not mistaken. Mike's already added the salt. He's getting ready to add the tomatoes with the juice. He's going to add the the um, chicken stock. He's going to add the tomato paste. Mm. He's going to let this then simmer down a little bit, and then we're kind of headed to the next step of adding the andouille and shrimp. But we're going to add the tomatoes. He's going to add all that juice in there too, just to give it some, some flavor. We're going to actually cook that down for a little bit. <laughs> just to thicken it up. So jambalaya should be a little bit pasty and it, it should not be soupy. So there's a big difference between like jambalaya and a stew. And, and one of the big differences is that it should be a, have a consistency level that that's thicker. What's, hey Kat, what's really crazy is 
I just got back from New Orleans last week, and it was one of my dreams to go there. I've never been. I'm a real big foodie. So the right when I got there, I was like, I got to try this jambalaya there. And I just noticed that their jambalaya is a little, quite different than ours. They use like a dark roux, and it's a little more dry. So I found that there's several different recipes, and, uh, you know, you can just kind of have fun with it. And, and uh, you know, there's just different ways to cook it. Absolutely. I mean, with classic dishes, there's always variation. I mean, that's part of the fun is that you get to put your own personal um, spin on it. And speaking of, you know, you have, you know, at Kenrick's, you have all of these foods, these kind of like Mardi Gras specific dishes to go. Like you have obviously the jambalaya that people can take to go, right? And also some gumbo. So kind of like take us through what people can walk in and, um, and snag for Mardi Gras. You know, I'm going to go up to the camera for this, but one of the things we offer is we have these little units and this is jambalaya. We also have the uh, red beans and rice. Nice. And then we also have the chicken and sausage gumbo. And these are all easy to pick up. Now, if you need larger uh, quantities, you can call that in. But we make all these dishes in our own kitchen at the store. Not in my kitchen, but in the kitchen at the store. <laughs> you don't have a certified kitchen at your house? No. I guess I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's great because, I mean, I, I think that these long simmered dishes, things like jambalaya, gumbo, red beans and rice, sometimes people are intimidated by the cooking process and how long it takes. So they might just be like, I'm too busy. I want this dish and I have a craving for it, but I just don't have time to make it. So knowing that they can stop by and grab that ready made from you guys is, is really, really nice. Um, so, you know, when you are developing recipes for your sausages, you mentioned kind of how the jambalaya came together. What is your creative process? Like, how do you guys, because you have such a range of sausages that, that you make, what do you, do you sit down and, and just kind of like brainstorm? How does all of that come together? You know, really, we have a really creative staff and Joe the Butcher has always been creative and always like to try different things. And we just have an open door policy. We, we employ about 98 people around there, 105, something around there. But we just let people do anything they want, and we try it, and if it's good, we sell it. That's what we want to do. So, yeah, On a side note, we, we failed a few times, too. So one time we had this brainiac idea to make gummy bear bratwurst. Oh. Not good, trust me. But uh, this idea come from Wisconsin, and we thought we were going to steal the market away. And guess what? It didn't happen. They were terrible. Imagine you try to put gummy bears through a meat grinder. I don't think that's going to go terribly well. <laughs> it was not good. It was not yeah. good. But but like I said, Mike said it best. Like we have a bunch of people coming in with different ideas, and some really work out. And when we all try them, we have a couple of different ones that have walked through the door where we looked at each other and we were like, "Man, this thing, this thing's perfect." Like, don't change a thing. And other times we'll tweak it. Like Mike and I are really involved in that part of it. We'll say, you know, you, you need more cheese or you need more garlic or fennel or whatever it would take. And again, it's it's the process of our team getting together and saying, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And it's hard to get a bunch of people together and have the same ideas, but we yeah. really kind of culminated together to come up with what we think is the best for our customers. Well, and we actually have a, a question from one of the folks watching at home. And so he recently acquired a backyard. Um, let me make sure that I have this. Oh, actually, it's 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 pushed down. It was a question that was asked earlier. But if I'm remembering correctly, he had he had a backyard grill, but now he has essentially a backyard um, like a plancha. It's it, it's essentially like a, a flat griddle. And he's wondering from a meat perspective, what's going to go really well on on that flat surface as opposed to a grill? Man, I'll tell you a lot of things. <laughs> I love those. Uh, they cook bacon and sausage for breakfast real quick and easy and pancakes and uh, the Philly cheesesteaks that you can get thin sliced ribeye you can put on there. There is just so many different things you can do with those flat tops. They're amazing. You can do quesadillas, stir fries. So you can get flint steak and slice that down thin and add all your veggies and little sesame oil or teriyaki. There's just open-ended things with those grills. I like a marinated flank steak that I make with couscous on mine, and it is really good. Like Mike said, flank steak, skirt steak, it's a flatter meat that you don't have to cook as long. I mean, you can still cook your hamburgers, your bratwurst, 
Whatever you want to cook on there is fine, but some of the things that turn out really well for me that I don't use my grill on are, are more of those flatter meats. So do you guys have those at home or are they just at the butcher shop? We both have them at home also. Oh, nice. Is it in the back room? We're grill guys, Kat, so we both have grills, but we also have flat tops too. So we both have like a cooking, cooking mechanisms outside. Nice. So where are we in the jambalaya prep? I see lots of stuff. Actually, he's ready. He's got a, we, we, we cut the step on the rice. So Mike's going to add the rice next, which is fully cooked. So you can put in the unconventional rice and let it simmer. We decided to cook our rice just for time's sake tonight. And really, we cooked our rice. He's going to stir that in. And then Mike's going to add the final step, which is going to be adding the shrimp and the andouille and the proteins. And then he's gonna, we're, we're just going to simmer this down and then uh, kind of take a look at it. And if you want a little more starchy, you can always add a little more rice. I, I kind of like a little extra rice myself. Um, but, uh, you know, you can make it your own and within with anything you do. I mean, so we are gonna make sure, we're going to make sure this shrimp is fully cooked before we're, we're going to serve. And that's going to be the one thing. Well, I'm happy to know that. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> I think it's really cool. The origin of jambalaya really came from New Orleans and the South, but really the Spaniards, Spanish people, make pay paella, paoli, paella. It's it's the rice dish where they cook it down. I'm sure you made it. Thank you very much. So they didn't have saffron. So this is how jambalaya originated from that Spanish origin, and I think it's really cool the way the whole thing came together and what we eat today. So this is like a a dish from. 200 years ago. And again, like I said, when, when they culminated to what they have today, it makes it to what we know as jambalaya. And I think it's a great way to look at how it's all come together, but it's a great dish. Absolutely. So guys, we have um, another question. So say you don't have, you know, the luxury of these outdoor grills and planchas and wonderful things like that. So if you're going to cook a brat inside, what's the best way to make sure that it turns out perfectly? There's a couple ways you can do it, really. Um, you can, I'm not a big fan of boiling brats, but if you pop it in, in some boiling water for about four or five minutes just to get that casing kind of cooked, then you can then you can actually take it out and put it in a little skillet and kind of pan, pan sear it so that casing kind of gets, you know, the, the crust on it. And Or you could, um, you know, you could do the same thing, put them in the, um, water and boil them and then you can finish them off in your oven as well and then at the end kind of broil them for a little bit the one thing that i noticed and, and you got to really be careful with brats is people like to overcook brats so they think that they're they're not done and they keep cooking them and cooking them and cooking them and then they're not as juicy and flavorful as they would be if you just cook them to the 165 degrees i, I really like to cook them in beer beer yes. water and so I simmer them with a little bit, not much. Like Mike said, I don't like to boil them, but I put that in the bottom of the pan. That's delicious. And, and I just brings on the flavor, brings out the flavor of the bratwurst. And you got that onion, that butter, that beer. You can choose your own beer. You're a St. Louis guy. I'm a Budweiser guy, so I like that in there. And, and I think it really turns out well. This is going to kill both of you. Your spirits are going to crumble when I tell you this. But I have one of my best friends. Um, her husband, whenever he grills brats, he pokes the casing while it's cooking, and all of that. Let me hold, like up, Let me hold it oh, up. I know, I know, and all of that amazing fat. He's just like, well, this is the way it's supposed to be done. I'm like, that is absolutely not. That the whole point is to keep the fat inside. That's where all the flavor is. So you know, I just also anybody who is considering that maybe you should—I don't know where he got that idea—like poke the the casing on the brat. I, I mean, you agree that's like a no go. Send him my phone number and I'll call him and straighten him out. <laughs> also, also, that's a good way to catch your grill on fire too. So you got to be careful when you're doing that. Also, good point. Good point. Um, so we okay. We're actually this is gone. This twenty minutes has gone so fast, you guys. Let's. So we got, we got the finished product. Oh my gosh. It looks amazing. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> I 
So for those of you watching at home, this is the magic of the tripod and the iPhone. I have the same situation happening in my kitchen for my demo. It's pretty amazing that you can do this now. So Mike and I actually did, we took it a step further. We uh, actually cooked some crawfish. I mean, somebody take, take, take crawfish out. You're killing like, me. Like we were talking about how, you know, you can change things up. And Steve's a big crawfish guy. I, I'm not a big, big, totally fan of crawfish. I did eat some crawfish when I was in New Orleans, and it was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I had the crawfish estouffee, and it, that, that stuff is amazing. But you can add that to it and really just make it your way. Oh, awesome. Mike, are you from Missouri? I am, yes. Well, then you have no excuse because Missouri, I mean, like spring-fed rivers and streams are full of fresh crawdads that are just waiting to be gathered up and eaten. Yeah, it's, they were totally different tastes than the ones I tasted here. Like, it was like almost like you're eating shrimp, and I was like, I do like crawfish. <laughs> we do a crawfish bowl for four that you cook yourself, and I had the luxury of building the recipe. So I was eating crawfish probably six weeks in a row until my wife finally told me, she goes, enough's enough. And thank God I hit the recipe on the last time because I think she was ready to kick me out of the house after I did it six weeks in a row and she said, Steve, I can't, I can't take any more. So we ate crawfish quite a bit to get to the point where we're at with it. Six weeks is a long time. I would have to say hats off to your wife for her patience and perseverance. I mean, it's, it's one thing to have it a couple nights in a row, but six weeks, yeah. that's pretty expensive. Um, <laughs> you guys, thank you. Uh, I hope you stick around to kind of like cheers everybody at the end. Um, I'm going to move on with my bread pudding demo, but I want to raise a glass to you and uh, say happy Mardi Gras. And happy thank Mardi Gras. You. Thank Thanks you so much for having us on, Kegs Cat. Absolutely. Cheers to you. Mm. So that leaves just me, um, which normally I'm used to having other people to kind of chit chat with but you might be used to watching me cooking things um, in this kitchen specifically. So I'm actually gonna put my jambalaya over here and I'm gonna get started on the bread pudding. You have this recipe in you, the packet that arrived with your box. It is um, kind of a crazy simple recipe that is uh, really delicious and you need almost zero skill in the kitchen to be able to make this amazing um, Tennessee whiskey soaked raisin bread pudding. And all bread pudding is, is essentially milk and eggs and sugar and bread baked. That's it. So I have three cups of whole milk and you want to use whole milk. You want the fat. It's where the flavor, I mean, frankly, that's where the flavor is. And I'm not going to add all of the milk at once. I want to see how much of the milk my uh, my bread ends up absorbing. So I'm going to do like maybe two and a half cups, and then I have four eggs, lovely eggs that are from a farm here in Missouri. Um, so I'm going to crack these guys in here pretty quickly and get them whisked up. I can remember. I'm telling you guys a kind of a secret. When I was like 14, <laughs> truly 14, and I had just moved to this area because my dad um, was military. Excuse me, I've got to grab a, I had to grab my towel. Okay, my dad was military. I, I just moved to the St. Louis area. I had all these new friends, and I loved watching on PBS like the, you know, the Julian Child shows, all this kind of stuff. And I decided that I had to have my own cooking show um, when I was 14 years old. And back then, you know, dating myself, it was like the VHS, the big VHS recorders or whatever. And so there are um, videos of me with my best friends from high school uh, baking boxed cakes. Uh, with me even made like commercial breaks and everything. It was very fun. Anyway, I digress. It's not what you want to hear. You want to know how to make bread pudding. Okay, I have half a cup of brown sugar. It can be dark brown sugar, light brown sugar, whatever you want. So I'm going to get this in there. Half a cup. All right. I have 
two teaspoons of cinnamon in the bowl. I have just a pinch of salt. You always want to balance out your sweet items with a little bit of salt, just kind of like life. Um, I also have some fresh nutmeg. And you can buy nutmeg in a jar, but it will not have the same flavor and aroma as something that you grind fresh. It's really, really easy to find this in a grocery store. Just get yourself um, a microplane and great. I mean, the, the aroma is so lovely. And nutmeg is great in um, cream sauces. Uh, you know, those types of sauces are, are fantastic with just a little bit of nutmeg to enhance the flavor. Okay, I also have, well, before we started the event, this was melted, now it's re-solidified. So we're just gonna pretend like it is still melted and put that also in the bowl. Whisk everything up. This is the kind of thing that if you have guests coming in, I know we don't have a lot of guests right now, but if you do have um, at any point in time, people who you want to feed the next day or a couple of days from now, this is absolutely the kind of thing that you could bake ahead and, um, and keep on hand and reheat it. It's, it's very sturdy, which is not normally something that is great in food, but trust me, it's delicious in this bread pudding. Um, it'll keep um, easily and reheat easily if you want. So I am whisking all of this up. It's looking good to me. Okay, now, I have brioche. Now, you don't have to have brioche. You can use even like white bread, wheat bread, multigrain bread, whatever kind of bread you want, quite frankly. Just not sourdough, because sourdough bread, um, it's sour and it won't taste very good with the sweet elements of this particular recipe. So I've already kind of cubed this up, not cubed, I actually just tore it into pieces. And I have the rest here. Now, I'm, if you're not familiar with brioche, it's very buttery, it's very rich, which is perfect for this because, hello, it's whole milk and butter and all these wonderful eggs and things and sugar. Um, but you'll notice that these are kind of like rolls and I went to the grocery store and I couldn't find like full loaves of brioche, but they happen to have rolls and it doesn't matter because you're tearing it all into pieces. And that's one of the things that I find that a lot of people who aren't terribly comfortable in the kitchen, they're like, well, it doesn't exactly match what I thought I had to do. And I mean, the reality is that's okay. I mean, if you know that it is approximate, you know, put your own spin on it. And um, so that's kind of where we are with these brioche rolls and not, <laughs> not loaves of brioche. So now all I'm doing is stirring this up. Essentially, you just want the bread to soak in all of that liquid. And because you do want the bread to soak this in, I would recommend that you use brioche that's a little bit dry or bread generally that's a little bit dry. Like you don't want something that's super spongy and soft because it'll just turn into mush, which this will turn into to mush a little bit anyway. Um, and so now I'm going to stir in, this is just a half cup of chopped walnuts. You could do pecans. If you're allergic to nuts, don't do the nuts. Um, but then if you do enjoy um, nuts, they're a wonderful uh, kind of crunchy addition because the bread pudding is very soft. Um, so that's something to consider. And then here are my Oh, now I've got the main camera. Here, okay, thanks, Bob. So here are these uh, uh, Jack Daniels soaked raisins. Uh, and quite frankly, this is where the recipe shines, in my opinion, because the flavor of that bourbon with the cinnamon, not the bourbon, with the Tennessee whiskey, pardon me, um, with the cinnamon and all that cream and butter and uh, bread, you... This stuff is yummy. I made this, um, actually there's a, a video on uh, feastmagazine.com with this specific recipe. And I remember I made it and um, the crew, one of the crew members uh, is British. And he was like, well, don't you have a sauce for that? And I was like, no, um, I think you should just eat it, you know, just 
slice it up and enjoy it, you know, whatever. And he was like, well, my mom always served bread pudding with the sauce, but he tried this and he was like, it doesn't need it. Um, so just a you know, word to the wise that if you want to serve this kind of a thing plain, you can, as long as you have enough of that wonderful kind of cream and egg and it's not dry. Um, so I have my oven at 350 degrees and uh, I'm going to show you my magic of television version of the bread pudding here in just a second. But I have to show you um, this wonderful pan. One of my neighbors gave this to me a couple of years ago for Christmas. It says feast in it. And so um, I'm going to bake this up and make sure that she's gifted this bread pudding. But all you do is pour the bread pudding into your pan. And this is obviously too small for that entire amount, but when you're baking the bread pudding, it's going to puff up. And this is a extremely generously buttered dish. So you'll see that there's butter kind of smeared everywhere and that's so it doesn't stick, but also for flavor. And so um, I'm gonna pop this into the oven. Uh, it's gonna take between 40 and 50 minutes to bake. It takes a little bit because it's very dense. So just be patient and I promise it will puff up and be golden. And I'm gonna show you, put my notes over here. <laughs> you can see behind the scenes. So this is my magic television version that I baked earlier today. And it's the full nine by 13 pan um, that is listed in the recipe. So you can see it just comes right out and except for that little guy it'll come right out there we go and just serving this up now if you had some warm maple syrup or even just some butter to drizzle on top if you wanted to get fancy and make like a creme anglaise or something like that it would be perfect on this but like i said it really it doesn't need anything other than maybe some hot coffee or a shot of Jack Daniels, quite frankly. Mm. Yep. It's good stuff. It's not too sweet. If you want, excuse me, the dangers of eating on television. If you want this to be sweeter, just add more sugar. Um, you could even add white sugar if you don't want to use the brown, which is going to have more flavor because of the molasses that's kind of left into left in the sugar as it's being processed. But there you have it. Super easy, super delicious, and um, something that, you know, when you're celebrating Mardi Gras, you make this in the morning, you have your big celebration, and guess what? The next day, you, you know, get this out. It doesn't even have to be heated up. You can eat it at room temp, and it is delicious. Um, so there you have it. And, oh, wait. So how long did you say for the raisins? I see that there's a question. So with the raisins, I typically let it soak overnight. If you don't have that amount of time, um, put it in a micro microwave safe dish and zap it for, you know, 10 seconds, maybe 20 seconds. Cause the idea is that that whiskey is going to soak into the raisins and also plump them up. So they won't just be, um, like oatmeal raisin cookie kind of raisins. They'll be kind of juicy and full of that bourbon flavor, um, which frankly is absolutely decadent and wonderful. Hold on, was there, whoop, we have another one. Is baking, baking, what does she say there? Oh, is it drier than it should be? So yes, my suggestion is make it soupier than you think that it should be. And I'm talking like seriously, a little bit kind of like, wait, that looks really gloppy. Um, what's gonna happen? Can you kind of, can you see that? It's, it looks like, it doesn't look very good uh, when you, if you can see that. It doesn't, it, that's, it's not very sexy looking. Um, and so the idea there is that as it bakes, all of that custard that you've made, the eggs and the sugar and the cream, they're going to bind with the bread. Um, so if your bread pudding is turning out too dry, that's why. Add more cream, add more eggs, add more butter. I mean, why not? It'll be delicious. Uh, and I think, yep, I think that that is it on the questions. But uh, I want to bring the guys back and, and raise a glass to them. Thank you.
again for joining us for this uh, wonderful Mardi Gras celebration. It couldn't have happened without all of you, and I hope you guys had a good time. We, we did. Thanks, E.T. Hey, thank you, guys. I'm really thank jealous you. that I'm not in St. Louis right now. <laughs> Cheers and happy Mardi Gras. Happy Mardi Thanks, Gras. Pat. Thanks, Bob. Awesome. Yes, we love Bob. So, just a little housekeeping before we sign off for the evening. Yes, I have my notes right here. I want to thank all of our sponsors. Once again, none of our events are possible without their support. Obviously, Jack Daniels, we want to thank them. We want to thank the folks from Kenrick's Meats and Catering. Um, also, the, uh, the Mass and the Beads from Johnny Brock's. Uh, we have our coffee from the Old Judge Coffee Company, which is this wonderful, um, you know, relatively new coffee uh, uh, coffee roaster here in St. Louis. And then finally, we have our liquor sponsor in Condigo Tequila. I have it right here in my glass. Um, I want to remind all of you that we have two more of these at-home celebrations, one for St. Patrick's Day and then one uh, Taco Tuesday. And I know that our, folk, our friends from Mission Taco are going to be joining us for that one. It's going to be super fun. Plus, we have one more wine tasting um, left, and that is Vignol. Our friends from Missouri Wine make that possible. Um, so I'm looking forward to that in April. I'm sure that we'll have other virtual events coming down the pike, but essentially, um, you know, what I want to do is say thank you to all of you for joining me tonight. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you also to, um, to Bob and to Courtney and to the entire team who made, you know, tonight possible and, uh, cheers. I'll see you next time. Great barbecues begin at Kenrick's. It's barbecue season, and Kenrick's is your one-stop shop for fresh brats, steaks, ribs, pork steaks, hamburger, everything for your grill. Kenrick's also has a full line of side dishes and all the fixings. Kenrick's St. Louis Barbecue Headquarters.